the opportunity to gather together, to learn, to glean, and to grow, and we pray that you would be pleased with what happens here today, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. You may be seated. Um, Dr. Haken is familiar to many of us, but maybe not all of us. Let me just briefly introduce him to you. He is professor of church history at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. They like to emphasize the the, I think, when they're down there in Louisville, Kentucky. He's also professor of church history at Heritage Theological Seminary here in uh, Ontario, in Cambridge. And he's also director of the Andrew Fuller Center for Baptist Studies. Have I missed anything? Are you in charge of anything else, anywhere else? Okay, so visiting professorship at, at, at Redeemer University. Well, Dr. Haken, we're glad that you're here with us today. Please come and, and lead us in our first session. Well, it's a, a real privilege to be with you, and uh, this has been a, kind of an annual event, and I look forward to coming back uh, on a regular basis to Richmond Hill. And I'm not sure how many years, we, there was a hiatus there for a period of time, probably during uh, the COVID era, but it probably goes back about 10 or 12 years. Um, and probably my initial association, I think, with Richmond Hill was when Pastor Perry Edwards was here. And um, also, some of you know uh, Bayou Andrew Song, who was uh, one of my PhD students. He started his kind of first uh, studies in the faith uh, here, attending uh, Toronto Baptist Seminary at the time. Um, a couple of things about the books at the back. There are a variety of books at the back. They're all $10. Uh, you can leave uh, if you purchase any of them. I'm, I apologize, I've only brought a few. Uh, I give a range there. Some of them deal with the subject that I'm looking at today, which is uh, the subject of friendship. Others of them deal with uh, an area that I've spent a lot of time thinking about, writing about, which is uh, Baptist life in the 18th century, or the 18th century. And uh, the 18th century is uh, a remarkable period, uh, very formative for who we are as evangelicals. In many ways, our faith is rooted in uh, the traditions and perspectives that developed during the Great Awakening and the revivals of the 18th century that completely transform the English-speaking world on both sides of the Atlantic and initiate, this is very, very important, initiate a global expansion of Christianity. Up until the 1700s, uh, Christianity had been, for a variety of reasons, almost completely restricted to the European continent. Um, Islam had come in, uh, dominating the Middle East, North Africa had destroyed uh, those early centers of Christianity. Uh, North Africa, Christianity was very, very strong in Africa, uh, virtually wiped out completely uh, during the 600s to about the year 1000. The only aware area where it survived in North Africa would have been um, uh, in Egypt, what is now the Coptic Church. And uh, it's very, uh, challenging to think of the Coptic Church having survived, significantly survived, under the persecution of Islam for the last uh, basically 1,300 years. Uh, the other area in Africa where Christianity had been strong was Ethiopia. And then there were Christians who had gone east along what we call the Silk Road. That's an area of trade that runs from the Middle East all the way over to China. Um, Christianity was in China in the 8th and 9th century, but the various imperial dynasties uh, rejected Christianity as a, a, a religious uh, perspective in China, and it was in many ways persecuted and almost totally destroyed back in that period. Uh, there were Christians in the subcontinent of India, uh, what is known as the Martoma Church, um, and, but by and large, Christianity had been uh, restricted to the European continent. Um, in the year 1700, for instance, Christianity, uh, evangelical Christianity, was mostly found in Western Europe and along the Atlantic seaboard where Britain had planted colonies uh, running from Nova Scotia all the way down to uh, Georgia. Um, Florida was in those days still under the rule of Spain. 
And uh, during the 18th century, there are these remarkable revivals uh, that uh, reshape uh, the society in many, many respects. And we're, we're an heir of those. And so I've spent a lot of time looking at the 18th century over the last uh, probably 25, 30 years as a, as a historian. And so a lot of the books back there reflect that. Some of them, a couple of them reflect the topic that we're going to look at today, friendship. And then uh, there is one there, and I, if you're interested, you can talk to me, uh, that is quite, quite different. And uh, during COVID, um, I decided, I'm not sure what prompted it to start to write children's books. And I, we, have, we did have three Siamese cats, and um, one of them uh, sadly died about a year ago. And uh, we've always loved Siamese cats. And so it's a children's story from around, for about seven to, well, even younger if you read it to them, uh, to about 10 years old. Um, and I have a trilogy of, I've only got one there, uh, the, si the, the, the Siamese kittens and the breadcrumbs. And I observed that our, our cats uh, like to eat toasted breadcrumbs. Uh, uh, very interesting. Anyway, it's a story about uh, it's, uh, uh, the way in which uh, God supplies our every need. So that, that comes in at the end of the story. But I have uh, two others. If you are interested, I can, I can get those to you. Uh, uh, they're quite off to, the, off to the side of what I normally write. So today we're going to think about friendship. I've got a biblical example that I'm going to develop at some length. And then I've got one from the 18th century. Uh, the biblical example is the friendship of Timothy and Paul. And um, there's a number of uh, passages that I want to look at. Uh, I'm going to say some introductory remarks about friendship as its importance. And then we're going to plunge into looking at this friendship of Timothy and Paul, um, mostly focused on uh, Philippians chapter 2 and then 1 Timothy. And then in the second hour, uh, the second lecture after our break, I'm going to look at the friendship of two men, Andrew Fuller, who was a Baptist leader of the 18th century, very, very close friend of a man who I suspect, I hope you've heard his name, William Carey. Uh, usually when you ask people, okay, name three prominent Baptist figures of the past, they normally come up, well, John Bunyan um, in the 17th century, William Carey in the 18th century, uh, and then Charles Spurgeon in the 19th century. Well, uh, Andrew Fuller was a very close friend of William Carey. Carey will go to India as a cross-cultural missionary. Um, he will be based in Bengal, in Serampore. Uh, he goes there in 1793. He will never come back to England. Uh, those were the days in which uh, missionaries, when they went out, they rarely came back. Uh, the, it would have taken him six months to have traveled back to England. The Suez Canal didn't exist in those days. You would have to go down around the bottom of Africa and then up uh, through the Atlantic. And that, would, that trip would take six months uh, to travel from uh, Calcutta uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, back to England. And then obviously he'd have to go back. So that'd be an entire year in travel. Uh, some of us who do travel uh, complain mightily about the amount of hassle and time it would take uh, just think of it, how many of you would be going on any sort of excursion if it took you six months to get there and then six months to get back. And uh, Carey is a very famous figure. He's, very, he's rightly, rightly remembered as the father of the modern missionary movement, at least English modern missionary movement. And, uh, but I want to think about a friendship uh, of one of his close friends, a man named Andrew Fuller, and another close friend named John Ryland. And it has some very significant... I think, uh, uh, impact or import uh, for us today. Let me say a little bit about friendship as a topic, and then I'm going to turn you to the scriptures. I begin with a quote. This is from a man named Graham Smith. Uh, Graham Smith, about uh, 10 years ago, started a magazine, a journal, uh, based around friendship. It was studies about friendship, um, historical studies, uh, psychological studies, sociological studies, a variety of studies about why friendship is important. And he, he said this in the introduction to the first uh, volume of that journal. What would human life be without friendship? 
how could we sustain not only all that is practical, but also the very moral fabric that makes us humans. Friendship makes our world meaningful. Without friendship, without the bonds between persons, no recognizably human world is possible. To think about friendship again is to begin to re-engage with a tradition that has been obscured in the modern world. That last point is significant, as we'll see. Um, during the uh, 20th century, there is an author, very familiar to you, I hope, C.S. Lewis. Uh, it amazes me, uh, whatever, I love, I love bookstores, so um, I was coming up Young Street, I came along the 407 and got off at Young, and there used to be an indigo was right at the corner there at Young and 407, and I had forgotten it moved, and so um, one of the things I'll do this afternoon, uh, I, have, I have an appointment in this evening, so I'll go to the Indigos, and I thought, oh, no, it's gone. And then I'd forgotten it moved up to, it's somewhere up on the, uh, the west side, further up Young. And I love bookstores. And I, it never amazes me, uh, going into a bookstore, how pretty well every bookstore you go into uh, has a couple of books by C.S. Lewis, just a remarkable, remarkable figure. And uh, C.S. Lewis one time wrote a book. He said it was the most difficult book he had ever written. It's called The Screwtape Letters. And you may know the book. And the Screwtape Letters is the, it's a series of letters from a senior devil named uh, Screwtape to a junior devil named Wormwood. And the names themselves tell you, uh, uh, kind of give you a hint as to their characters. Screwtape and Wormwood. Uh, um, and Wormwood is his nephew. Now, of course, uh, devils don't have intimate relations like that. So uh, it's, a, it's a bit tongue in cheek. And um, it's a difficult book because, for Lewis to write because he's writing the whole thing from the vantage point of our enemy. So every time you hear something commended, um, it's actually the exact opposite of what we, we should be commending, etc. Anyway, in one letter, one letter Screwtape writes to Wormwood, and he says this, that in modern Christian writings, there is to be found few of the old warnings about worldly vanity the choice of friends, and the value of time. And so three things, worldly vanities, things that, that basically eat up your life that are empty and hollow. Uh, secondly, friendship. There's very little about modern, modern writings about friendship. And thirdly, about the use of time. Um, I've lived long enough now that I'm, I'm very aware of the passage of time and how Time goes so fleetingly. Um, my children are in their early 30s, and you wonder, like, where on earth did time go? I can remember them being born, and my daughter going to kindergarten at the age of four. Uh, she couldn't wait to get to kindergarten. I remember the, 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 the uh, challenge it was to watch a little person go down the driveway off to kindergarten, and I was thinking, oh, she'll look back, and no, she didn't look back at all. She couldn't wait to get to kindergarten. And um, she's now, you know, living, she's lived the last year, 10 years in Vienna. She's involved uh, in a bank over there, Esther Group, uh, First Bank of Vienna. And you just wonder, like, where did, where did time go? How, how does it go so fast, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it is important for us as Christians to think about uh, sinking your life into that which counts. Uh, worldly vanities, spending your life on that which is meaningless. Um, and also the value of time. Uh, time is like a stream. It's going in one direction and you can't recapture it. You can't go back and, oh, wouldn't it be great to go back and relive all that? Well, you, you just can't. But also friendship. Uh, I'm not sure if there were no books. Lewis is complaining about about the fact that there were no books written about worldly vanities and the value of time in the 20th century that he was aware of. I'm not sure if he's right on that, but he is right about the issue of friendship. Um, for a variety of personal reasons, I won't get into this, uh, friendship has been something I've thought about for most of my life. Um, 
gr the context maybe I was growing up in. I'm, I'm the child of, uh, of immigrants, um, immigrants initially to Britain. My father was Kurdish, a Sunni Muslim from Kurdistan in Iraq. In the late 40s, he came to Britain to study engineering, left his family at the age of 16, never, ever saw his parents again. Um, that was a decision he made, and uh, he never really conveyed to me the reasons for it. But uh, he never saw his parents again. And uh, had no roots in England. He was by himself, as it were. Met my mom. My mom also was an immigrant. Uh, she was Irish, Catholic. And uh, I'd come over to, to work in Cadbury's Chocolate Factory in Birmingham. And they met at a dance and married. And then we emigrated to Canada. Another, to me at the time, I was 12. I was deeply uprooted. Um, I hated Canada when I first came. I was here, uh, came in the, in the mid-60s, and I couldn't get used to the food. You might think British food, Canadian food is the same, but it's not. It's slight differences. Um, couldn't understand what corn was. Uh, we didn't have corn in England. Uh, couldn't understand why the peas in Canada tasted sweet. Uh, they obviously, have, you, you get used to these things over the time, etc. And I, 12 years old, 13 years old, is not a good time to make a, a move. And I, I suspect that it was at that point that I, I, I had two very close friends. Um, a man, a young boy. It's interesting how you remember these things. Uh, Christopher Janaway, Harry Weinberg. Harry was Jewish. Uh, Christopher, I'm uh, just a, a normal English kid. And uh, with the internet, you, interesting what you can try to trace. And uh, I've tried to trace them and have no idea. I've never come across their names on the internet or whatever. But from a very early age, friendship was very big to me. My father was uh, a professor of electrical engineering, a master, very tied to his work. Um, probably a workaholic, I think. I did very well, but I hardly remember my father growing up. And I think I invested myself in friends. So friendship has always been subject, something I've been very, very interested in. And uh, one of the greatest joys of my life are having friends. And so um, when I became a Christian, I began to look for books on friendship written in the 20th century. And C.S. Lewis is right. There's virtually nothing. Now, that's changed. In the last probably 15, 20 years, there's been studies of friendship. It's very, very different, the modern perspective on friendship. That is, it is not a worthy subject of, of, of uh, literature. It's not a worthy subject of philosophical reflection or theological reflection. It's very, very different from the world prior to the rise of the modern world. So if you go back, I'm going to give you a very quick history of friendship, and then we're going to look at uh, the Bible. If you go back to the Greeks and the Romans, uh, the Greeks and the Romans, and uh, thinking about friendship, they were very consumed with the question of, what is friendship? Why is it important? How do you make friends? How do you keep friends? When is it appropriate to end a friendship? And uh, so the great uh, Greek philosopher Plato, there are two or three of, if you know Plato, you may have studied Plato in, in university or high school or read him. Uh, Plato has two or three of his books devoted to friendship, asking those questions and trying to think about them. Aristotle, the other great philosopher of the ancient world, the Greeks, he has a whole, uh, he has a major work called the Nicomachean Ethics. It's a book on ethics. It's how should we live. Uh, one of the differences between philosophers uh, up until the modern period and philosophers in the ancient world, particularly in the ancient world, is philosophy was designed to help you to live. Um, I took a baccalaureate, a BA in philosophy at the University of Toronto. Um, it became pretty obvious to me uh, pretty early on that my teachers were not men I could go to. I don't remember ever having a woman. This is back in the 70s now. But that my teachers were not men I could go to to ask them about how to live. Uh, for them, philosophy was an academic subject. 
It had nothing to do necessarily with real life. But that's not the way it was in the ancient world. Plato did, I mean, his, he's a well-known, obviously, philosopher, has been studied down through the years. And he, he wrote, he, the books that he wrote were designed to help you live well. And um, uh, he, therefore, he, has, uh, he tackles the subject of friendship. And so does Aristotle. In a whole book on, on ethics, he's got two major chapters, or two major books, actually, on friendship. What is it? What is a friendship? Why is it important? How do we begin it? How do you make friends? Um, Etc. Uh, when you come to the Bible, uh, the Bible doesn't have an extensive, like I can't turn you to a particular book in the Bible that, that, that is focused primarily on friendship, but you have all kinds of material in the Bible that deals with friendship. So, for instance, um, if you're feeling up to it, tomorrow uh, afternoon, instead of maybe having uh, a bit of a snooze, uh, which is not a problem, uh, you know, uh, whatever. Uh, why don't you sit down and read the entire book of Proverbs at one sitting? It'll probably take you about two hours. And note everything it says about friendship. And you'll find it has all kinds of nuggets of wisdom about friendship. Proverbs 18.24, there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Um... I know in recent days that's been argued, that's our Lord Jesus Christ. You, you may um, uh, have noticed, I noticed it because I knew what I was going to be speaking about. In the hymn that we sang, there, is a, there was a little line there about, through the blood of Christ we become friends of God. Um, and often that little passage, Proverbs 18, 24, there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother, is, that's the Lord Jesus. And it is true of of our Lord, but also it tells you that friendship in some ways, we have that saying, blood is th thicker than, than water. In other words, your, your family are, are closer than, your, than anybody else. But in reality, you often find that you can grow up in the same household with somebody and have, in, as, as time goes on, virtually nothing in common with them. Um, and friend, there are friends that you have are much closer to you. Um, I still remember very, very clearly my, when we moved to Canada, my, one of my uncles, my favorite uncle, George, George O'Gorman, my mother, remember, was Irish, and her maiden name was O'Gorman. George O'Gorman, I don't expect you to know the name. He was, he's an actor, still living. He knew people like Richard Burton, Laurence Olivier, Peter O'Toole, these are actors of a bygone age. And he opened an acting school in London. And he was my favorite uncle. I can still remember some very vivid scenes of when I was nine or 10 years old of little thick kindnesses he did. When I was uh, probably about 20 years ago, I was at a conference in London. And I asked him if I could stay with him. And I went down and uh, did, was in the conference, stayed with my uncle. And uh, earlier that week, I'd been down in another part of England, down in what's called the West Country, down in Devon, where I had stayed with a Christian brother who I didn't really know that well. And he had been remarkably kind to me on, during the week, a number of very, very uh, profound kindnesses. He went out of his way to help me in a couple of things I was doing. And uh, I remember staying with my uncle, who I had always adored growing up. And when I was leaving, um, he was in a, an area of London uh, that was in the north, and I had to get down to Heathrow Airport. And it's a, London can be a real hassle getting around on the subway, uh, the, the tube or the underground. And so I asked him if he could give me a ride to the airport. And uh, he said, well, no, I, I, can't, I can't do that. And so he said, you just need to catch the, the underground. And the under, it was going to be a big hassle getting to the underground. I, I, when I travel, I don't travel light. I wish I did. Some people do. Uh, and then I have the tendency to buy books. <laughs> and that's a real problem. So I've got the number of bags I'm lugging. And I'm thinking, like, I, I thought, I, I'm going to hire a taxi. So I, I, was, I called a taxi. And then my uncle said to me, he said, well, if you're taking a taxi somewhere, uh, maybe they could drop me off and I'll, I'll come along with you. And I'm thinking, oh, okay. And it, it, it really was a bit of a revelation that a, a Christian brother exercised kindness to me in a way that my own uncle uh, did not. 
And uh, I see the, the reality of that. A friend uh, sticks closer than a brother. Or uh, Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times. Well, the reality is friends can disappoint you. <clears throat> and I'm quite certain if we went around the room and we did a poll, all of you could tell me of a friend who disappointed you. Um, or if you can think back, there may be friends you've had who you no longer have any dealings with. And uh, sometimes it's because they disappoint you, they let you down. And, uh, but a friend loves at all times. If you're really a friend with somebody, unless they, they turn to become an, your enemy, you should stick through it with, right, thick and thin with a friend. So there's all kinds of nuggets about friendship in the book of Proverbs. We have also examples of friendship. Uh, Ruth and Naomi. What's very important about that friendship, it it crosses generations. Naomi is the mother-in-law of Ruth. Um, uh, One of the questions I'll ask you is this. Do you have friends who are not of your same age group? That is, they're a generation older. I think one of the areas in which we, at least my experience of church life has been a failure is that so frequently older brothers and sisters in Christ, men in their men and women in their 50s, 60s, do not invest in younger men and women in their church. And that's absolutely, that's absolutely vital. <clears throat> uh, do you have friends who are older? And uh, when you get older, have you sought to purposely build friendships with people who are younger? Ruth and Naomi is an example of an uh, intergenerational friendship. Again, in what our, church, what our churches have tended to do, right? we have young people's group, and we have young adults, and we have uh, seniors, as if they're the only people who can, you can build a friendship with, somebody who's of your same age. But it's very important to build those friendships across generations. Uh, Jonathan and David. So we have nuggets of wisdom in the Old Testament about friendship from the book of Proverbs. We have examples of friendship, and I'm going to give you one in more detail. Um, the, the Old Testament has two ideas about friendship that are very important. Uh, so if you have a Bible, uh, turn to the book of uh, Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy 13 and verse 16. I'm going to read a bit of the context and you might be thinking as I'm reading, this has got to be the weirdest context to talk about friendship because as you'll see, it, it doesn't initially appear to be talking about friendship. Deuteronomy 13, I'm going to begin at a verse, um, verse 6. Uh, so Deuteronomy, uh, verse, uh, 13, Deuteronomy 13, verse 6. If your brother, the son of your mother, or your son, or your daughter, or the wife you embrace, or your friend who is is as your own soul, entices you secretly, saying, let us go and serve other gods, which neither you nor your fathers have known, some of the gods of the peoples who are around you, whether near you or far off from you, from the one end of the earth to the other, you shall not yield to him or listen to him, nor shall your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him, nor shall you conceal him, but you shall kill him. As I say, you might be thinking, well, (laughs) this is the weirdest passage to be talking about friends. Um, This is a, a very important passage because it tells us how God, how seriously God takes the worship of idols instead of himself how seriously he takes that. Um, Obviously, in the New Testament, um, there has been a change in this. There is a discontinuity in that sense between the Old and the New Testament. Um, We don't kill uh, our uh, relatives, uh, et cetera, et cetera, who become idolaters. But that's another, that's another, that's time. That's another sermon, another, another story. But notice, no, this is what my, my point is. Notice how the, a friend is described. Um, so you get the, you know, the wife, the, 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 the son, the daughter. But notice it says, uh, your friend who is as your own soul. That's a little definition of friendship. 
This comes up, this idea comes up, I, I could give you four or five examples of this in the Old Testament. A friend is somebody who is like your own soul. The Hebrew, the Hebrew actually says, uh, who, uh, uh, who is like a friend, who is a friend who is knit to your own soul. A friend is somebody who is intimately involved in your life. They're not simply somebody you meet as an acquaintance and you, 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 you say hello and you're, you have a few polite remarks. They know a little bit about you. They get to know your name and where you live maybe, um, etc. But a friend is somebody who you admit into the inner sanctuary of your life, who knows things about your inner being, as it were, um, who is he's almost like your own soul. In other words, a friend is somebody who uh, there is an intimate relationship here um, in which you open up yourself to your friend. It's obvious, I hope it's obvious, that you can't have tons and tons of friends. So a thing like Facebook, right? <laughs> Uh, Facebook is really a bizarre, uh, I'm, on, I'm on Facebook, but it's a bizarre experience in some way. You know, all these friends, uh, most of whom you really don't know, right? Uh, and you, most of you, I hope, aren't opening up yourselves in the terms of all your, your inner thoughts and challenges and thinking on Facebook. I, I mean, some people do. You know, even to the point of photographing what they're about to eat for breakfast. Uh, please, no offense if you do that. Uh, I, I just think that's weird. You know, it, it's cool for you, maybe, you know, okay, I had this for breakfast, and, you know, maybe somebody in your family is interested in that, but, you know, all your Facebook friends want to find out what you had for breakfast? Well, okay. So that's one little example. So that, this is this, uh, one little definition of friendship. A friend is somebody who is party to your inner thoughts. You've opened up your life. It's somebody you can be transparent with. The other uh, little uh, image of friendship um, is found in uh, Exodus. So these are both found in the, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. It's Exodus 33. So you go back in towards Genesis Exodus 33, and it's verse 11. And again, the, the passage, the, the main thrust of the passage, is got not, it's got nothing to do with defining, it's got nothing to do with friendship as a subject, but it, it's a casual little remark. It's Exodus 33 and verse 11. This is the way it, it, which is described here, how, how Moses, how God would speak to Moses. Exodus thirty three eleven, and thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. What is a friend? Well, Deuteronomy: a friend, a friend is somebody to whom you can open up your life. I mean, there are there are certain people, and I'm sure you've met them, and I I can think of one or two people who are gushy about everything that's going on inside their head. Uh, that's unusual, and it's probably not wise. Uh, that's, but a friend is somebody hopefully you can trust and tell them about challenges you're having or thoughts you're having or things you need prayed for. A friend also is somebody you speak face to face. It's a very vivid image. Um, one of the challenges of friendship, uh, one of the challenges that we need in our lives, we need people in our lives who will speak to you honestly about your life. Um, hopefully, if you're married, your spouse is such a person. And I thank God for, for my wife over the years um, who... Uh, has been such a remarkable friend. And when she thinks I'm wrong, she'll tell me that. she Mike, Mike, I, Michael, I, I think you're just wrong on this. And uh, early on in our marriage, um, 
trying to argue for the biblical headship of the man, I would often say, well, <laughs> yeah, okay. So in this decision, you know, I'm the head of the house. We'll, we're going to do this. And over the years, I've learned nine times out of ten, my wife's right, and I'm wrong, and I need to listen to her. And uh, thank God for people like that in your life who they love you, and you know they love you, and they'll speak truth to your face. Again, our society, we're polite, and we don't want to necessarily say exactly, no, I think you're just dead wrong on this issue. And you need to change. Or I think you should do this, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, there is a, a boldness and a transparency that is there in friendship. These two little passages, they're kind of throwaway texts, but they go to the heart of what is friendship. Friendship is a, is a real friend is somebody who, is, who you allow to know the inner workings of your soul and your life and your challenges. It's also a person who can speak truth to you, who can speak plainly, right to your face. So let me turn then, there's a lot more I could say about friendship in the Old Testament, but let me turn to looking at uh, Paul and Timothy. I'm not sure what you think about when you think about the Apostle Paul. I think there is a common view of the Apostle Paul as kind of this lone ranger. Um, I'm dating myself here. There used to be a show called The Lone Ranger, which was this kind of guy he used to wear a mask, and he went about doing good. Uh, but even he had a friend. He had a, uh, an indigenous uh, person named Tonto who would go along with him. But the idea of a lone ranger, you're out there by yourself doing uh, whatever. Uh, and with the case of the Apostle Paul, Paul is out there by himself planting churches, uh, blazing a trail through the wilderness of idolatry in the Greco-Roman world. But the reality is, there are around 75 people who we know by name, who Paul names in his letters. And he's never, he's never without friends. He's got, in fact, he has a circle of men who walk with him in his ministry all through the years. And one of them was Timothy. Let me show you when they first meet, and then I'll take you to uh, Philippians. Now, the first time they meet, is in the book of Acts, and we read in Acts 16. And um, Paul is, he is in a place called Antioch, and it's technically Pisidian Antioch. There's about five or six towns called Antioch in the Roman world. And uh, he'd been kicked out of Antioch in... Uh, uh, the previous uh, uh, passage. And uh, in Acts 16, verse 1, we read this. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew his father was a Greek. And that's the first time that Timothy comes into Paul's life. Um, Timothy is probably around 16 to 18 at this point in time. I say that because about 20 years later, uh, Paul in, in 1st and 2nd Timothy, Paul can refer to Timothy as a young man. Now, some of you will be very encouraged by this. Up in Greek and Roman thinking, you're a young man till you're 40. So my son turned, is turning 30, 30, he was born in 91, so 33. Math has, math has never been a big strong suit. Um, and uh, he's, he's been complaining to me about him not, he's not I'm not young anymore, he's, he's been telling me. Well, in Greek and Roman thinking, you're, you're young until you're 40. And then it, it, it's really bizarre because you're, you're uh, an adult, mature man for 10 years, and then at 50, you're old. So, uh, anyway, that's Greek and Roman thinking. So, uh, he's probably around 16 here. And uh, Paul, Paul is building a, what I tend to call the Pauline circle, or an apostolic band. Paul is very well aware of a great truth in 
which, which is true in church history, that when God does a great work, he always does it through a group of men and women. It's never just through one person. I'm a church historian, and uh, I know the way in which church history, we remember, okay, the Reformation. Who started the German Reformation? Oh, yeah, Martin Luther, as if he did it all by himself. Well, give me a break. I mean, he's got a whole bunch of friends around him. John Calvin, the same in Geneva. And whenever God does a great work, there are a circle of men and women who work together. And that is true for Paul. And Timothy then will become one of his close friends. Notice uh, Timothy. Well, Timothy here probably starts off as what we might describe today as a... um, uh, this word has just come into fashion, a mentee, right? We've got mentors. A mentor is a person who disciples or uh, trains another person, and the person being trained is a mentee. It's a weird word, I think, M-E-N-T-E-E. And that's, I think that's the way the friendship, the relationship starts. Uh, Paul's guiding Timothy, helping him think theologically, helping him show how to do ministry, but that's not the way it ends. By the way, Paul at this point in time is in his 40s. So he's a man in his 40s, uh, taking under his wing to guide him and develop him as a minister of the gospel, a young man in his mid-teens. He comes from a broken home. Um, His mother is a Jewish believer, um, but his father, Luke tells us very clearly in the book of Acts there, his father was a Greek. His father was not a believer. Not because he was a Greek, but because he was simply not a believer. And at some point in the past, his mother must have disobeyed her own tradition and married outside of Judaism. She married a pagan. And he wouldn't let her have Timothy circumcised. Uh, If you read the book of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, you'll know he allowed her to teach Timothy the scriptures but he wouldn't let her have him circumcised because in Greek and Roman thinking, circumcision was utterly abhorrent. So their friendship begins. Now I want to jump forward. This is probably around the year 48, 49 AD. Now jump forward about 10 years to the book of Philippians. Uh, Let me begin with Philippians 1.1 and then I'll go to chapter 2. Philippians 1.1, 1, 1. this is very easily overlooked, and in fact, I think it's regularly overlooked. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. Who wrote Philippians? Well, the standard answer is Paul wrote it. Well, that's not what Paul says. Paul says, Paul and Timothy. In fact, if you go back, uh, you don't need to do this, but you can just go through, look at the beginning of all of Paul's letters, and you will find that 2 Corinthians 1.1, Paul and Timothy, 1 Thessalonians 1.1, Paul and Timothy, 2 Thessalonians 1.1, Paul and Timothy, and Philemon 1, Paul and Timothy. I don't know how you've envisaged in your own mind, how did Paul ever write these letters? What was the procedure? You need to think of a group of men, at least three or four. Paul, Timothy, and then the man who's actually doing the writing. And there might be one or two of them. Uh, Paul does write letters in his own hand. He mentions this in Galatians and 2 Thessalonians. But in Galatians, he says at the end of it, see with what large letters I have written you. And it would appear to me that what Paul does is the letters being written, and then at that point, he picks up the pen and writes. Uh, We, pretty well all of us, have learned two skills right from the very beginning of our young lives. We've learned how to read and write. In the ancient world, this, this is probably striking to you or shocking to you. In the ancient world, about 10% of men and women could read and write. Actually, only 2% of women. The vast majority of women were illiterate. 
and only about 10% of men. So if this was a typical early church congregation, I'm not sure how many are here this morning, only about, only about a tenth of the men here could read and write. The rest of you are illiterate. And only 2% of the women here can read and write, and they, you could only read and write if you're among the upper class, the aristocracy. And um, <clears throat> the two skills are separate. We, we learn reading and writing at the same time. In the, in the ancient world, you, you learned how to uh, read first and then write later. And a lot of people who could read could not write. And so whenever you wrote something, you normally had somebody who was a trained writer to write the letter. Paul is writing a letter in Philippians to the whole church. It's going to be read out. It has to be legible. Um, I'm teaching at Redeemer University, and because of the introduction of uh, AI and chat GPT, uh, they're very concerned about plagiarism. Now, it's a Christian university, so you shouldn't be bored, concerned about that, but reality is reality. And so that means then the final exam, I'm teaching a course on Western civilization, the final exam this next week, two weeks, um, they're going to handwrite I've got 45 students. I'm not looking forward, in one sense, to reading those exam questions. They're under pressure. They got two hours to do the three hours to do the exam. I, I know for a fact some of the, the it's always some of the writing's going to be almost illegible. So that you, 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 that's that's just a challenge in that respect. Think about okay. Paul wants to write a letter that can be read publicly. It's got to be legible. He's not a good writer, it would appear, so he's going to hire somebody to write the letter. So that person's in the room. When this is being written, there's not just simply Paul writing by himself like you would. There's Paul, and he's dictating the letter. Uh, students of, of this who've studied figure it would, take, it would have taken Paul to dictate this letter like word by word, um, now, you can read it probably in about an hour, less than that, probably about 35, 40 minutes. But he's got to think about the words he's saying, how he's chosen it. You can imagine him saying it. No, no, I don't think I want to say it that way. Let me try this. Um, most scholars think he probably took him about four or five days to actually write the letter. Um, and the Holy Spirit's guiding him, but it's, it's fascinating to think about it. So you've got Paul, the guy he, who's, he's dictating to. By the way, that letter has to be letter perfect, easily read because when it comes, okay, it's got no chapter divisions. It got no verse divisions. Chapter and verse don't exist. It has no spaces between words. You think about, think about text with no space in between, no punctuation. And you've got to figure out, okay, where does this word end and the next word begin? And so even reading the letter out loud is going to be interesting. But my point here, and I've taken far too long to talk about the mechanics of the writing of the letter, the point here is that not only Paul wrote the letter, but Timothy wrote the letter. And you can imagine Paul saying, okay, let me, let me say this. Um, Timothy, now, now I think we should put it this way. Now, take a look at chapter 2. Um, I realize I'm, I'm, I, I've, only got, <laughs> I've only gone through about a third of what I want to do in my first talk. So I think what I might do is we will have a break after we look at Philippians. And then I'm going to pick up 2 Timothy, and uh, I'm not going to get to Andrew Fuller and the 18th century, uh, because I think Paul and Timothy, it's, it's very, very instructive. But anyway, we'll see. Okay, chapter 2, begin at verse, let's begin at verse 1, and I'm going to read all the way down to verse 20, uh, 23, 24. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ... Any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. 
Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which was yours, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality of God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of his servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. So in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and rejoice of you all. Likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice of me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely interest, concerned for your welfare. They all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it all will go with me. And I trust in the Lord, Lord that I shortly that shortly I myself will come also. So the first part of the passage, which runs from verses 1 down to verse 11, is an admonition to live as Christ lived. And uh, there is in the church a controversy that's going on. Take a look at chapter 4 and verse 2. I entreat Euodia... And I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, my true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. There's a quarrel going on in the church. These two women who Paul admires, who have been co-workers in some ways with Paul and Timothy in the church at Philippi, are at loggerheads. They're quarreling about something. Paul doesn't go into detail. And so chapter 2, he emphasizes, as a body of believers, you need to have the same mind. You need to love each other. You need to have the same love, being in full accord. You need to have one mind. You're not to think only of yourself and your own ambitions and your own desires, but you, think of, you should think of your brothers and sisters. And then Paul gives two examples the first one is Jesus. And I know chapter 2, verses 5 to 11 is often used to emphasize a very, very important theological point. That is, our Lord Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. He was, before his the incarnation, fully God and still is fully God during his incarnation. He shares the being of God to the full. In fact, uh, uh, his becoming man in, in, is an act of humility. But he did so out of love for us. You need to think then, he's, Paul's saying, you need to take Jesus as a model. Paul is not primarily in this passage make, making a theological point about the deity of Christ and about the incarnation. He is emphasizing you need to think about how our Lord Jesus lived his life. He didn't first and primarily think about his own interests, but he put aside, he put aside his, his, the, the, the right that he had to stay in glory with the Father, fully equal, fully sharing the being of the Father. And become, but he became man. He humbled himself. And Jesus is set as an example. But then he gives you a second example, 
And this must have been very interesting. Timothy's right there in the room. He's been writing sort of the letter. And then Paul now says about Timothy, I hope in the Lord Jesus sent Timothy to you soon, so I may be cheered by news of you. I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. They all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 21, and then look back to verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Jesus didn't think about his own interests. Notice what he's saying. The, 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 the language, actually, in the Greek is identical. Timothy doesn't think about his own interests. I mean, it's an, I mean if you were Timothy, I think you'd be, it'd be embarrassing. Like Paul's saying, okay, I want to give you two examples of what it is to live without being controlled by your own interests, living for others. First one is the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that, that's a great example. The second one, Paul says, is my brother Timothy. That's why I'm sending it to you. So you can see in the flesh somebody who loves you as your own soul, who's concerned for your interests, and not only for his own. He is a man of remarkable humility. That's what he's saying. And as I say, Timothy's involved in writing the letter. Maybe at that, I'm sure at that point, Timothy took his, if he was actually doing the physical writing or the dictating, no, no, no like, he's not saying this about himself, but Paul is saying it about it. It really is remarkable. The other thing that is noteworthy here, too, you know Timothy's proven worth how as a son with a father, okay, so he likens Timothy as son and a father, and uh, Timothy probably came to faith through Paul. He's got a Jewish believing mother, but in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, Paul talks about him as his true son, his dearly beloved son. So I tend to think Timothy came to faith under the preaching of Paul, even though he was raised in a Jewish house, Jew, a believing Jewish household with a believing Jewish mother. Uh, he has served me as a son, but notice he has served with me. It's very easy to overlook these little prepositions. He doesn't say he served under me. The Apostle Paul does not have disciples. He has men and women who work with him. There is never, a, this is very significant about leadership. Uh, there is never a hint that Paul saw himself in some way as the authority over Timothy. He's an apostle, of course he is. And he has apostolic authority. But it's very significant at this point he says, he served with me, not he served under me. I think that says a lot for the way Paul sees their relationship. Paul's an apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ. Timothy is part of that apostolic band. He's, he's basically one of those men who gave up all, whatever, whatever, think of it. He's a 16-year-old when Paul meets him. He's got the whole of his life ahead of him. Who knows what he was thinking he'd like to do. And along comes Paul and says, I, I think God sets you apart for ministry. And Here's an idea. Well, why don't you come with me and tramp around the Mediterranean for the next 30 years? And we'll plant churches together. What do you, what do you think about that? Now, who knows what Timothy wanted to do with his life? And he gives it all up to go with Paul and help Paul realize the calling of Paul's life. Now, 2 Timothy. So it's 22, uh, 11. So I think probably... Uh, we, we, we started at what? We started at 9.30. Was it 9.40, uh, Jake? Okay, so we've been going an hour, so I think we should break. So we'll see if I get to, to Andrew Fuller and uh, Ryland. But uh, well, why do we break at this point? Um, I, I, I'm, I, you'd think by this point, I've been teaching for 40 years, I'd be able to judge how long it takes. Anyway, um, so it's 22, why don't we break uh, till uh, 11 o'clock and then we'll go till noon and then we'll have a Q&A. So if you've got questions, uh, keep them till, till that time. So uh, I'll come back 
and I'll be speaking, so that, that's how you know uh, we'll be starting afresh. We'll see how we go. Um, I'm going to turn your attention to 2 Timothy and uh, this letter that was right at the end of Paul's life. And then if I have time, I will say a little bit about Andrew Fuller. I do want to leave room for questions. Um, I think uh, the overall emphasis of our time together is that friendship is a vital aspect of our Christian lives together. And it is one of the ways in which God enables us uh, to stay faithful and to stay true, true and to flourish not only as human beings but also flourish as Christians. So let me turn then to 2 Timothy. And um, I'm going to read the first chapter and then I'm going to read uh, chapter, part of chapter 3 and into chapter 4. A little background, uh, 2 Timothy is written by common consensus at the end of Paul's life. Um, it obviously follows 1 Timothy. Uh, these letters are written after the events that are narrated in the book of Acts about Paul's imprisonment. In the uh, late 50s, uh, 58 actually to be exact, we can actually date a number of events in Paul's life very accurately for a variety of reasons. Uh, around the year 58, the Apostle Paul went up to Jerusalem. He went up with a large collection of money that he had been collecting for the best part of probably eight or nine years. Um, on a previous visit to Jerusalem, around the year 46 or even earlier, the Apostle Paul, uh, it's narrated, it's told us in Galatians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul tells the Galatians that in chapter 2, in chapter two he says that he went up to Jerusalem, uh, he met with Peter and James, Peter and John, the disciples of our Lord, and James, his half-brother, who had been converted, and he wanted to make sure that the gospel he was preaching was identical to theirs, and it was. And he says, as I left, they, re they encouraged me to remember the poor, which I was eager to do. And um, the poor in mind there are not poor people everywhere in general, but poor Christians in Jerusalem. Uh, there are a variety of reasons, which for sake of time I won't go into, but there, there are a number of believers in Jerusalem who are deeply impoverished. And so Paul makes it a point of, uh, as he plants churches, Paul makes it a point of encouraging them to store up a certain amount of money week by week, month by month, that he would then collect and take up to Jerusalem. So in 1 Corinthians 16, for instance, written around the year 55, verses 1 through 4, you may know the passage very well because it's a passage that deals with, at the first day of the week, set aside some money. And the money is actually for these poor Jewish Christian believers in Jerusalem. 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, he spends two whole chapters talking about this collection of money he is making. And he's encouraging the Corinthians, you need to be diligent in setting aside money for these poor believers. Don't let the Macedonians who have been set aside money out, outstrip you in their generosity. And it's in that passage he says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, which I think he's referring at that point to the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that God having been generous to us, so should we be generous to our fellow believers. And then in Romans 16, chapter 15, the last half of the chapter, he tells the uh, Romans, I'm coming to Rome. He wrote this in 58. I'm coming to Rome. I've been longing to see you for many years. My ministry here in the Eastern Mediterranean has prevented that. I'm now on my way to Jerusalem to deliver a collection of money. And by this point in time, Paul has come to see the collection of money as sim not simply a, a financial uh, help 
to poor Jewish Christian believers, but he's come to see it as a symbol, a tangible symbol of the unity of Jew and Gentile. That in the Lord Jesus Christ, the ethnic divisions, and we would say today maybe racial divisions, that's not a word that's used in the Bible per se, that those divisions are overcome. In Christ Jesus, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. And Paul sees the, the collection of money as a way in which Gentile believers can indicate that they are one in Christ with their Jewish brethren. And uh, what is very significant is as Paul goes up to Jerusalem, which is narrated for us in Acts chapter 20, Timothy's with him. As he goes up to Jerusalem, he's warned a number of times that he's going to get imprisoned or he's going to get killed. And Paul indicates that he is willing to die for the Lord Jesus Christ. And what's significant about that is that Paul is willing to die for the unity of Jew and Gentile, which I think is a rebuke to so much that has happened in the history of the church and as so much that is happening in certain quarters today where people are willing to divide from each other at the drop of a hat over a variety of things that are not essential issues. That Paul is willing to die for the unity of the church. That our union with brothers and sisters, of course we sometimes have disagreements, uh, disagreements that are minor issues and we have to learn how to disagree. Sometimes we disagree and we have to form separate congregations, but we still must love brothers and sisters wholeheartedly, even if they disagree with us on certain secondary issues. Because the Apostle Paul is willing to die for the sake of the unity of the church. He goes up to Jerusalem, and sure enough, he is nearly beaten to death. All of this is narrated in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 20 onwards. He's nearly beaten to death in the temple. Now, Jewish leaders see him in the court of Israel. That is, the, the temple was divided into four courts. There was the court of the Gentiles, where Gentile believers could go, but no further. And if, you're, if you're not a Jew, you couldn't go any closer to the, to the inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, than the court of the Gentiles. There were steps that then led up to the second court, and there was a wall with signs on it that basically said, if you are not Jewish and you go beyond this and are caught, you have your own blood uh, uh, to, to, on your own, it's on, it's on your own head. In other words, you, 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 you'll be killed and it's your fault. So the, the next court is the court of the women and then there's another few steps, the court of Israel where Jewish men could go uh, women couldn't go beyond the court of the women, and then Jewish men, and then there's the Holy of Holy, the, the inner sanctuary where only priests could go, and then the high priest in the Holy of Holies. Um, it's very interesting in the book of Ephesians, that in chapter 2, Paul says uh, that the, all of those barriers have been pulled down by our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm, I, I'm sure he's talking about, he says, actually he says, the wall of separation between Jew and Gentile. And I, I, I can't but imagine that he has in his mind's eye the temple. And uh, Paul is seen by Jewish leaders, who are not Christians, in the court of Israel, the Jewish men, and they grab him. They don't try to kill him there. That would pollute the inner, one of the inner courts. They drag him out to the court of the Gentiles where they start to try to beat him to death. Now, providentially, there is a Roman garrison, because the Romans occupied Jerusalem, right next door to the court of the Gentiles, and there was a stairwell that came down. And the Romans come down, um, uh, a, uh, a squadron of Roman soldiers, they rescue Paul, and in the Greek, it's very vivid, as they are rescuing Paul, they body surf him up to the, to the, to the garrison. They pick him up because the Jews are determined to kill him. They pick him up and carry, they hand him up bodily. I don't know if you've ever seen this done. I, I guess you see it at uh, pictures of rock concerts. I've been to such for well, a long time before I was converted, but whatever. You <laughs> body, body Sir Paul up to, to the garrison. And Paul's imprisoned them for two years in uh, Palestine. And then he goes to Rome. 
and he's in prison there two years. And Luke ends the book of Acts with Paul was under house arrest for two years and was able to preach the kingdom of God without hindrance. At some point after that, he was released. So all of that is an aside. Some point after that, he's released and he writes 1 Timothy and Titus around 62, 63. In 64 AD, there is a great fire in Rome that burns down two-thirds of the city, maybe five-sixths of the city, and Christians are blamed. And that begins a long history, 250 years, of persecution by the Roman state against Christianity. And uh, from that point on, Christianity is an illegal religion. And Paul is rearrested about 66, 67. As I say, we can be very precise with the dates. It's quite amazing. And it's in that context, he's in Rome, he writes the letter from Rome that we call 2 Timothy. He has gone through a, what we call a first defense. Um, a first defense is where lawyers get together to determine, we do the same, Lawyers get together to determine whether or not a, there is sufficient and valid uh, uh, evidence to take a, a matter to court. And he's gone through a first offense, but he has no doubt of the outcome of the trial, which is in 2 Timothy 4. He says, um, I have run the race. I have fought the faith. Uh, I've fought, uh, fought, fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. And now there is laid up for me a crown. He, uh, he, he expects to be martyred within weeks, at most a couple of months. Now, let me emphasize before we read the sections, so this is all background that you need to know. Let, let me emphasize before we read the sections that he probably wrote the letter in the late summer. It's going to take two to three weeks for the letter to get from Rome to where Timothy is. Timothy is in Ephesus. And uh, we have enormous amount of information. There is a website called Orbis, that is a, has mapped out the Roman world. It's a fabulous website. And how long it would take you to travel, let's say from Rome to Ephesus in the summertime, by sea, by land, uh, how long it would take you in the autumn, how long it would take you in the winter, etc., etc. The reason we know that is these, the people who've mapped the whole map out have gone to all the documents we have from the Greek and Roman world, which is a ton of stuff, and taken everything that relates to travel. And so I was using it this past week uh, for a variety of uh, things, and it's absolutely incredible. So we know it would take a letter, about two weeks, good weather, to get from Rome to Ephesus. And so the letter that we know as Second Timothy is going to arrive somewhere mid-September, maybe. And Paul, you will see in chapter 4, Paul will say, Please make sure you come to see him before winter. Winter starts in the Mediterranean mid-November. You do not sail the Mediterranean if you're smart between mid-November and mid-March. Now those were months, winter months, dangerous weather on the Mediterranean. If you don't, if you don't sail on the Mediterranean, then you're going to have to go by land, and that'll probably take about a month in the winter time because you have to cross. Uh, the, the, I'm assuming you have some idea of the geography here. Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should have had a map. Uh, you have to cross the Hellespont into northern Greece, all the way up through the Balkans, right to the stop of the Adriatic Sea, and then cross the Alps and come down into the Italian peninsula. And that's going to take you about a month. And so keep all that in the background. So first, Second Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, to the will, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember your constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, the faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure, I'm sure dwells in you all as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, 
but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the praise, by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believed, and I am convinced he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Anisiphorus, for he often refreshed me, and I was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. Now jump over to chapter 3 and verse uh, 10. You have followed me, my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch and at Iconium and Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when, up, when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Therefore, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Do your best to come to me soon, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come... Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus, a truss, also the books, and some of the, par above all, the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to, to stand by me, for all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So, so I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Pris and Aquila and the household of Nesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth. I left a Trimus who was ill at Miletus. Do your best to come before winter. Eubulus sends greetings to you, as do Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Well, as, you, as I said earlier, uh, Paul is surrounded by people. 
And in fact, uh, at the end there, chapter 4, um, the, the man he lists, Demas, Crescens, Titus, Luke, uh, these are part of Paul's apostolic band. Titus is the same man as we know the letter to Titus was written. He appears in 2 Corinthians as well. Um, Tychicus is mentioned here. Uh, Tychicus is mentioned as a number of occasions. He's the letter carrier on a number of occasions. Uh, the person who carried the letter was very, very important. First of all, you have to trust him to get the letter you're sending to the people you're sending it to. This is a world in which there's no mail service, right? Uh, which is a common part of our world. Well, maybe not increasingly common. Now we use email. But uh, we still use the mail system, Canada Mail, Canada Post. Uh, that doesn't exist in this world. The only people that had a postal service was the Roman emperor uh, at the time would have been Nero. And he had a postal service. Nobody else did. So when you sent letters, you had to send them through friends, acquaintances, or you might risk, you know, you're down the marketplace and you get chatting with, with somebody and you say, oh, yeah, I'm sending a letter tomorrow to my brother in Ephesus. Oh, well, hey, by my cousin Billy's off to Ephesus or Billius, you know, Roman name. Uh, Billius is off to, to, uh, to, to Ephesus. Uh, oh, maybe he'll take your letter for you. Well, you've got no idea who Billius is, but he's going to Ephesus, so you entrust the letter to him. I'm positive Paul is not entrusting the letters to some Tom, Dick, and Harry, uh, Roman names, whatever, uh, who he just met. You know, he's going to be sending them by somebody like Tychicus. The letter carrier is very important because the letter carrier would bring the letter. He would then publicly read the letter. Remember, only 10% of people could read. He'd read the letter. He'd know where to make pauses. And then he'd answer questions about the letter. Right? Uh, when people would say, I, well, what's, what's Paul saying in that line? I mean, I, I, I can't figure out what he's saying. Can you read it again? Well, it still doesn't make any sense to me. Like, what is he saying? And Tychicus then would be able to explain the letter. So that's very important. So that he's already got this kind of apostolic band. He refers to a variety of, of people here. Um, you get a feel from the first chapter of the, the warmth of these two men. Um, notice in verse 2, chapter 1, my beloved child. Uh, Paul uses a phrase here, that speaks of uh, this, this relationship of love that there is between these, these two men. Um, we live in a world, uh, sadly, which has become so heavily sexualized. And um, the, how, do, how do men show love and respect to another man without it being misinterpreted in our world? When I was growing up in England, uh, I, don't, I, I go back to England pretty well every year, or to Britain and Ireland, and um, when I was growing up, I, I, I haven't seen this in more recent years. If you had a very close friend, I remember having the two close friends I mentioned earlier, Harry Weinberg and Christopher Janoway, you would, if you were on your way to school and you drop by their house and walk together, you'd put your arm around each other. I'm quite certain if you did that today, people would think things. Um, women, older women, uh, would sometimes hold hands. And again, you've got, you've got our, our culture. We have lost something, deeply lost something, by the sexualization of all relationships in our culture. But I think it's impacted men more than more than women. How do men show their their love for a fellow brother? Um, we have two things here. One is the the words. The other is the tears. I constantly remember you, by the way, in my prayers night and day. That's also a way. If you have friends, you pray for them. Like it, it strikes me that if you've got a person you regard as a close friend and you don't pray for them, like it, are they really your friend? Friends pray for one another. Thirdly, I, I pray for you night and day by the way, it's interesting he says night and day. He doesn't say day and night. The Jewish day always began in the evening. So he's thinking night and day. That's his day. His day begins around 6 o'clock in the evening and then runs through 6 the next day. I pray for you night and day. I'm reminded of your sincere... Well, 
I constantly remember, uh, I, con I remember you constantly in my prayers, nine day, I rem as I remember your tears. He doesn't tell us exactly when he's thinking of maybe an event, maybe more than one event. Maybe it was the last time Timothy saw Paul. Paul was arrested, and Timothy wasn't. And Timothy began to weep. Um, again, we have different kind of ethnic context here. My context is uh, an Irish Catholic context with a Kurdish mother, a Kurdish father, a Middle Eastern father who embraced my mother's culture completely. So if you met my dad, he's still living. He's got an English accent, pure English accent. I don't think I ever heard him ever say a word that betrayed his Kurdish background. His mother tongue is Kurdish, Arabic, uh, and Turkish. He also had those. He didn't give us any of those languages, which I deeply regret. Um, he came to Britain in the 1950s and I think experienced uh, racism. And uh, my birth name, for instance, is Azad Michael Anthony Hakim. And he anglicized our names um, to Michael Haken and Azad got dropped off. Um, and uh, I think he experienced a degree of racism in Britain and became somewhat ashamed of his background. I could tell you in 10 minutes what I know about his life. Uh, it was only last year I first saw a picture of my grandfather, one of my cousins in Sulaymaniyah on the Iran-Iraq border sent me a picture of my grandfather. My father never spoke about his father or his family. Some of it might have do, had to do with the fact he became a Catholic and he's from a Muslim, and he was cut off that way. Some of them might have to do with that. But I think some of it also was a shame factor. Um, but there were certain elements of my dad's character that he couldn't shake. And one of them was, uh, during my teen years, I was a very, in my dad's words, a very naughty boy. <laughs> and uh, one time I was hitchhiking uh, on the Hamilton Mountain. It was 3 in the morning. And I was 16 years old, couldn't get a ride. I was with a friend, and I phoned my dad. Dad, I, you know, I'm here, stuck in the middle, whatever. He, and he came and picked us up. And uh, the first things he said to me was deeply embarrassing. I'm with a close friend. Michael, you are a very naughty boy. <laughs> and my dad, sometimes my naughtiness moved my dad to tears. I can still remember one time... Um, and I look back, I don't look back at those years. I think there's a funny element to those years, but there's also a deep shame. And um, I used to drink. And I remember coming home one time inebriated and my dad just weeping. My dad didn't drink, nor did my mom. And uh, I remember just looking at me, just weeping. And I thank God for a father who could weep over his son. Uh, upset at my, my foolishness uh, because Western culture, English-speaking Western culture, has kind of moved, moved away from that in the 20th century, especially in the 19th century. They developed this whole idea that men don't cry. So my, my father-in-law, who's Scottish, uh, raised in a Victorian world, born, born 1925, all of his teachers would have been Victorians very proper. And um, one time my son was crying about something, four years old, and my father-in-law said to Nigel, my son, Nigel, stop crying. Men don't cry. And um, this is so far removed from this world. And I, 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 there, I think one of the challenges that men have had in Canada, America, the Western world is because of that British background that real men you know, you, you, real men, women cry, men don't cry. And uh, that's not this world. And the problem then, how do you men, so we've got, we've got I think we've got two strikes against us in, in the West, we're Western men. You, you've got this, this culture now that is heavily sexualized, and then you've got this background of how do you show, how do you show love? Men to man. And there's is obviously for, for Paul and Timothy, Timothy's love for Paul broke out into tears on, who knows, what, what, maybe it was when he was arrested, maybe other occasions. So that gives you the background. Paul's in prison. 
Notice this is also derives to friendship, not Timothy's friendship per se with Paul, but another man's friendship, Anesiphorus. Notice in verse 8, Paul says, do not be ashamed of the gospel. Paul's in prison. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of me. Verse, uh, verse 12, I am not ashamed. You'll note the word ashamed picks up three times. Don't be ashamed, Timothy. Don't be ashamed of the Lord Jesus or of me as prisoner. I'm not ashamed. And then look at verse 16. May the Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus. He often refreshed me, and he was not ashamed of my chains. He, when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. Onesiphorus is only mentioned one other time, right at the end, where he's mentioned in chapter 4, verse 19, where Paul says, Greet Pris and Aquila and the house of Onesiphorus. Anesiphorus was a man who lived in Ephesus. He's in Rome. We don't know why he's in Rome. Was he there on a business trip? Did he purposely come to Rome to find Paul? Uh, whatever the case, he gets to Rome and he seeks for Paul and he seeks earnestly. Notice when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly. It wasn't easy to find Paul. That's why most scholars who argue, or look at this text say this is not the same house arrest at the end of Acts 28. In Acts 28, Paul's under house arrest, and people came to him freely, and they knew where he was. In this case, he's somewhere in a dungeon in a city of a million people. Who knows where he is? And you, you can imagine Onesiphorus going to Rome and the prison officials, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find the prisoner Paul. Well, he's not in this section of the prison. Who knows where he is? And you can, find, you can imagine, okay, Christianity now is illegal. Th th let th think of it in our context. It is illegal for us to gather like this. Christianity is illegal. One of us, and we'll, we'll use our dear pastor here, gets arrested. Jake gets arrested. Pastor Clemens gets arrested. Would you go and visit him? Because if you go and visit him, you're identifying yourself as a person of interest. Why, why, why do you want to visit him? Are you identifying yourself as a fellow Christian? And the, the risk is, I've never been in a prison, but I can't imagine going in to visit somebody and those doors locked behind you. You might not get out, right? Christianity is illegal. This is, this is not a democratic, <laughs> this is not a democracy. This is a, Rome is a military dictatorship. So you might end up in prison with them. And, but he not only goes once, he goes back again and again. Notice he says, he often refreshed me. It's an amazing, I, I mean, Onesiphorus is one of my great heroes in one sense. We hardly know anything about him, but the snapshot we have of him is a man who is loyal to the Lord Jesus Christ because he's loyal to Christ's apostle. He's loyal to the gospel to the point at risking his life. That's what friendship with Paul meant for this man. And I think, again, what Paul's doing for Timothy, he knows Timothy's worth. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But he's reminding Timothy, this is the sort of friendship that we've built. You need to, be, you need to remain loyal to that friendship, even if it's going to cost you your freedom. In chapter 3, he talks about Timothy's background with him. Um, he talks about Timothy's fact that from uh, the time of his childhood, verse 15, from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred scriptures. That's how we know Eunice and Lois, remember they were mentioned in chapter 1, um, his, uh, uh, back in uh, chapter 1, his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. That's how we know they taught him the scriptures. The word childhood here is a very unique, it's a very distinct word. It doesn't mean a baby. Uh, we've got different words, right, for kids, right? We've got uh, babies and infants and toddlers. I'm not sure. I mean, an infant, I guess, covers everything from a baby to a toddler. And then a child. 
Uh, when does a child become a child? What age? A toddler, I guess, is up to about four, maybe. Then it's a child, a child up to 12. Um, uh, we've got different words, and so it is in Greek. And the word Greek word here is, is brephos, B-R-E-P-H-O-S, transliterated. Brephos, and it's a toddler. And the, the, rabbi, the Jewish rabbi said, as soon as a child can say, Imma and Abba, uh, Mommy and Daddy, you should teach them the scriptures. And that's the age. So he's known the Holy Scriptures, he says, since you were a brefa, since you were two or three years old. Um, he then talks a little bit in chapter 3 about when they first met. Uh, if we had time, we could go back to Acts 16 and the surrounding passage. That's what he's alluding to, verse 11. My persecutions and sufferings that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, Elystra. He, he's reminding Timothy, think back 25 years when we first met uh, Paul had actually been beaten up and left for dead. And uh, he had found his way to Lystra and Derby, and that's where he met Timothy. Remember those days, and remember, notice, you've known my teaching, my conduct, verse 10, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. How did, one of the very important things here is how did Timothy get mentored by Paul? How did Timothy, how did Paul pass on the faith to Timothy as a potential leader? Well, he taught him. But that's not all he did. And I've been involved in the academic world all my life, uh, literally all my life. Um, uh, in England, we start grade one at age four. And um, I can still remember crying about going to school. Uh, we lived with my great granny, and my great granny took my side, oh, don't send him to school. I can still remember that, one of the, my earliest memories. No, no, he's got to go to school. And uh, I've been in school ever since, right? I did uh, primary school, middle school, high school. So, as soon as I finished high school, I went to university, uh, Western Ontario. Then I did 10 years at Toronto University. Then I started teaching at Central Baptist Seminary. And then I've been teaching it ever since. And so I've, my entire life has been in school. And uh, I'm involved in teaching. And I'm teaching men and women for Christian ministry and vocational leadership in the life of the church. But notice that's not simply, that's not the only way, and that's not the central element that has to be communicated, right? You have to, we have to teach people in classes, but there's this, there's a whole other world here. What, what, how did Paul teach Timothy? My conduct. You've, you've learned about how I live my life. And so I have, a, I have a number of PhD students. And one of the things I do with my PhD students, I teach them classes. But then sometimes, uh, and not as much recently because of COVID and all that, but I'll go to England on a research trip and I'll say, why don't you come for two weeks? Um, you, you need to do research in this area. But there's more going on there in my mind than research. What's going on in my mind is we're going to spend two weeks on a plane and having meals together and walking together. And I see that as a mentoring relationship. Um, I I guess to some degree this was done with, in my case, and I see this as part of my responsibility. My responsibility doesn't end with, okay, you come to class and you're here for three hours, and maybe I meet you a few times outside of class and I help you write your thesis. It's rather they see the teacher in a variety of circumstances. Um, what do you like when you miss a flight? Right? Um, and you have to stay overnight in a hotel near the airport. Or I've never had to sleep in an airport, but some people have, obviously. In other words, what, 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 what's your life like? Or what's your aim in life? So I, I'm a very big believer that teachers in my world have to get to know their students well enough, and the students them, that really they get to know what the way their teachers click, what tick and click. <laughs> Um, I had one student, he probably took it a bit far. He 
He must have heard me teaching on this. He said, well, okay, what I want to do, I'd like to come and live at your house for a month. And he did. He turned up and lived with us for two weeks. It was interesting. And uh, I thought, oh, that's probably taking it a bit far. But you, you see, my, my point is, Timothy's walked with Paul. It's not just Paul, you know, okay, we're going we're gonna to do Theology 101, and we'll meet on Monday morning from 9 to 11, and then we'll see you next Monday. No, no, they, they walked together. They ate meals together. Timothy got to see Paul in all kinds of scenarios. He got to see what drives this man. What's his aim in life? What, 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 what is patience, his love, his sufferings? I mean, all of you are involved in Christian churches. Some of you are in vocational leadership, and you need to be thinking, if you're in leadership, of mentoring other leaders. How do you do that? Well, there you go. It's right here. And you need to build into the lives of those you're training to. And we need to be. You need to be intentionally thinking about handing on the faith. So, Paul calls all that to mind. And then he says, you know, um, uh, I've kept the faith, chapter 4. I'm being poured out as a drink offering, verse verse, uh, 6. Time my departure has come. Paul has no doubt (laughs) within the next few weeks or months, he's going to be executed. And by tradition, he would have been executed by the sword. Um, Romans had different punishments for different citizens. If you were a citizen, you were entitled to a variety of privileges. If it was a capital offense against you, you'd be beheaded, which would be a swift death. Uh, A Roman swordsman would slice your head off. If you're not a citizen, then they could scourge you, they could whip you, and then they'd crucify you. And the Romans liked crucifixion because it took, it could take up to three days to kill you. And it's agonizing, and it's public, and it's shameful. Uh, None of our portraits of our Lord in his death do justice to the, the event. Obviously, in one sense, they can't ever capture it but the one thing they don't capture is he was crucified naked it was it was a it was agonizing and it was shameful and the romans did this to non-citizens for paul he would have been executed with a sword he has no doubt this it faces him in the middle of this notice what he well and also he know he notes that when he actually had to go before the roman tribunal he says the lord stood by me that he had a deep, deep sense the Lord Jesus was there through the power of the Spirit. And then in the middle of that, though, notice what he says in verse 9. Do your best to come to me soon. So you might, I, I think one of, the, one of the things I thought when I read this was, okay, Paul, Paul's facing death, and he's walked with Timothy, and uh, yes, there's this friendship there, but um, the Holy Spirit has been with Paul. He, he's an apostle. He's actually seen the risen Christ. No, no, none of us here have seen the risen Christ in the flesh. Paul has seen the risen Christ in the flesh. He could have touched him like Thomas did. And yet he wants to see Timothy. And he mentions it twice. He, does, he mentions it right at the beginning. Do your best to come to me soon. He tells Timothy where all of his, these others have gone. And then he comes back to it again. Do your best to come before winter. And um, it's, uh, to me, it's absolutely amazing. Here is this man who has seen the risen Christ, who knows powerfully the presence of Christ, in that prison cell, in the Roman courtroom, and yet he still wants to see Timothy one last time in this world. And I think it bespeaks... Is he going to give him more communications about the Christian life? Well, he's, he's given them in Second Timothy. Timothy's walked with him for like 25 years. If he doesn't know the faith now and all the details of how to do church, well, you know, you're not going to get it in a few hours maybe when he'd see him. Why does he want to see him? 
because of the depth of that friendship that had grown over the years and the love that was there between him. And again, Paul, like us, is an embodied person, right? And the presence of another human being. I think one of the most challenging things that we went through with COVID um, was, it wasn't, as some depicted, the whole state thing, you know, government mandates. It was not for the way we had to follow some of those mandates. It was not being with brothers and sisters and seeing each other face to face and I know some churches, our church did this, uh, we had some of the stuff, we did it online. And it was, it was good, but it wasn't great. Uh, you could see people in, you know, on, but there's something about the physical presence of another believer that can't be captured in any other way. And uh, Paul's in kind of a situation like that COVID, right? He's using the letter as a substitute for personal presence. But he still wants to see Timothy. Make sure you set out. And I, as I say, the letter was probably sent late summer, early September. If it, if it takes two weeks to get to, to Ephesus, that means early October. That means Timothy's got six weeks to get everything in order. And then he's got to leave by boat. If he doesn't leave by boat... He'll have to go over land, which might take up to six to eight weeks, and Paul will be dead. Did he go? Well, let me show you a tantalizing little verse in Hebrews 13. And we didn't get to Andrew Fuller, but if any of you are interested, I can send the lecture. I have it all written out. Um, but we'll have questions after I read Hebrews 13. And it's at the close of that letter. Hebrews 13 and verse 23. Um, Hebrews is definitely written before the year A.D. 70. Uh, most of the New Testament is written before the, AD, the year A.D. 70, the fall of Jerusalem. There is not a hint in Hebrews that the temple has been destroyed. Uh, that's why it's written before A.D. 70. So Paul, think about this. Paul arrested 66, 67... He died as a martyr. He definitely is dead as a martyr before 68 because he, in 68, the emperor Nero dies and every, every historical account and tradition we have after the New Testament says Paul died as a martyr under Nero. So Nero's dead in 68. That means Paul is executed 66, 67. So Hebrews then, written before the fall of Jerusalem, he says this in Hebrews 13, 23, you should know our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. So did Timothy go? I think, yeah, Timothy went. And I think Timothy got arrested. But not martyred. But Timothy did get arrested. Now, there's a degree of speculation in that. But let me stop here. Um, uh, I, as I say, I'm still amazed. I, I can't calculate how much time it takes me to do something. And, uh, but anyway, any uh, questions or, or comments, uh, and maybe we'll take, if you have them, you know, 10, 15 minutes, um, et cetera. Uh, let me, in, in a nutshell, let me say what I've been trying to communicate, and that is friendship, Christian friendship is absolutely essential for you as Christians. Um, if the Apostle Paul so longed to see his close friend in the, the moment, the weeks before his death, that's how important it was for him, then how much more important, uh, and then how equally important is it for us? Uh, friendship um, is a very fragile thing. It's not like a marriage relationship. In marriages, we have public uh, commitments and covenants. You make vows. You sign documents. Uh, when you get a, 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 a job, uh, uh, you're employed as a job. I imagine... Uh, I haven't done anything like McDonald's for years and years and years, but I'm sure when you, you take a job at McDonald's, you sign a, an agreement, right? I would think. Uh, most jobs that all of you are involved in, you've signed a contract. And if you don't turn up and uh, uh, um, uh, fulfill the, the requirements of that contract, you're in trouble. And likewise, none of you, I suspect, when you to build a friendship, have a contractual agreement, right? But I, I'm positive I could go around this room and most of you 
will have had friends and you have no idea where some of them are today. Not because you had a break, but because time, right? You're busy. We're all very busy. And friends are too easily dropped. And what I'm encouraging you to, to, to do is two things. Number one, to see friendship as an absolute essential in your life. God has given you Christian friends. Secondly, you need to treasure them. And you need to take time for them. And yet it'll take time from other things. But you need to take time, face-to-face time. Uh, Facebook will serve, phone calls, emails. But nothing can substitute for sitting across from a friend at a Tim Hortons or a Starbucks, depending on your, 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 your choice, or a meal, or whatever. Okay, any questions or comments before we conclude for today? Yes. Friendship. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I asked if I could summarize very quickly. So if I'd had time uh, to go into Andrew Fuller, uh, William Carey is very well known, cross-cultural missionary, went to India in 1793. He would stay there until 1834. Uh, when he went to India, he had a group of friends in England, um, Andrew Fuller, who was a Baptist pastor at a place called Kettering, uh, John Ryland, who was a Baptist pastor in Northampton, uh, Samuel Pierce in Birmingham, um, and uh, John Sutcliffe in a little village called Olney in Buckinghamshire. Uh, John Sutcliffe was uh, the Baptist pastor in that village. Uh, John Newton was the Anglican minister who was there for about five years while uh, uh, Sutcliffe was there. And uh, uh, Fuller would later say, um, when Carey proposed to us the idea of cross-cultural missions, nobody had been doing this. In the, nobody had virtually done this in the English-speaking world. The idea of it was really kind of outlandish. Um, when uh, he, Fuller would say, later say, when Carey uh, came up with this idea, it was as if Carey had come to us with a discovery of a, a gold mine. And Carey said, I'm willing to go down into the gold mine uh, by being let down by ropes but will you please hold the ropes to let me down? And Fuller said, we pledged with him that we would hold the ropes till we died. And uh, in other words, Carey goes to India because he's able to go because he has a band of brothers, friends, men and women who, who supported him in prayer and letters. Two of those friends were John Ryland and Andrew Fuller. Very, very close friends. Um, Fuller would later say, if I didn't get a letter from my friend John Ryland every two weeks, it pained me. Uh, they lived eventually at a distance of about 200 miles, not big at all. But they only probably saw each other every year, probably for three or four times a year. They had fundamental agreements on a large number of subjects. They had shared concerns. They were both involved deeply in the revival of Baptist churches in the end of the 18th century. There was one area they disagreed on. So I want you to think in your minds, what is the most, what is the area up, upon which Christians today most strongly disagree? Think of that in your mind. And the area in that day was the issue of open and closed communion and open and closed membership, which was this. In John Ryland's church, to become a member of his church, you had to be able to profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It had to be real. And that was sufficient for membership. He's a Baptist. He did not insist that you had to be baptized as a believer by immersion. To partake of the Lord's Supper, you simply had to be a believer in Christ for John Ryland. One of his deacons was not baptized until five or six years after he'd become a deacon. Andrew Fuller was the exact opposite view. In Andrew Fuller's church, you had to be baptized as a believer by immersion to be a member, and you had to be baptized by immersion uh, as a believer to partake of the Lord's Supper. So when Fuller would, it, would have the Lord's Supper, it would be once a month, always on an evening, uh, the Baptists in that period argued, it's the Lord's Supper. We do it at night, not the Lord's lunch or dinner or breakfast. It's the Lord's Supper. 
Um, so when it was done in the, in the, uh, in the evening, uh, Fuller would make, uh, before the table, he would say, now the table is open to all of you who are, who are walking with the Lord in obedience and have followed him in the waters of baptism. Ryland would never have said that. So these two men are very close. Carey goes to India. He goes out there with two very close friends, William Ward and Joshua Marshman. I have on the back table uh, the biography of William Ward. It just came out. Uh, um, uh, I collect biographies of William Carey. Uh, since he died in 1834, there's been about 80 biographies of Carey. I've got about 70. The only ones I'm lacking, there's two or three published in India that I haven't gotten. Um, William Ward, this is the f second biography ever to be published on William Ward. Um, he died in 1823, and we had a conference on him in uh, Louisville uh, in 2023. And uh, so Carey goes out to India with William Ward and Joshua Marshman. They are surrounded by Hindus and Muslims. There's a few Christians in Calcutta, Anglicans and Presbyterians and Baptists. And so William Ward and Carey decide we're going to open the table to anybody who loves the Lord Jesus. They write back to Fuller. Remember, the letter takes six months to get back to Fuller. Fuller's ha not happy. He writes back to them. You can't do that. We're Baptists. We believe in believer's baptism. You shouldn't be opening the table. to even doesn't matter who they are. They could be Jonathan Edwards, uh, John Calvin, Martin Luther. They've not been baptized. They shouldn't partake of the table. So that took a... So the, Kerry had written a letter. It took a year for him to get the reply, right? Six months to England, six months back. They don't agree. They send a letter back to Fuller. Finally, after about four years, Kerry closes the table in Calcutta. And he announces that the Lord's Supper will be for those who have been baptized as believers. At that point, Ryland was upset. And he said, I went to, to Fuller, and Ryland actually preached his funeral sermon. Um, in the, we, he, it was recorded as he began to preach, he broke down weeping. He, he could hardly get through the funeral sermon. He also would write his biography of his close friend. He said, I went, I went to Andrew Fuller and he said, I expressed myself as strongly as I could to any man in England. And then this little, little statement, without giving him offense. And uh, for me, one of, the, one of the, 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 the fabulous elements of their friendship is that they could agree, disagree on a major, the, the, probably the major issue of the day, and yet be the closest of friends. And I, I have seen the exact opposite of that in the last four or five years in far too many Christians online, men who walk together and now are calling each other all kinds of names because they couldn't agree on how to respond to the state mandates about uh, masks and all the stuff, you know, we, all the stuff we went through. And uh, should everybody have a conviction about that? You betcha. Is that a primary issue? I'll be honest, it is not a primary issue. It is, the, one of my, the, my wife and I are members of West Highland Baptist Church. We used to be members of another church in Burlington, a big church. They split right down the middle, an ugly, ugly split of 200 believers and destroyed the unity of that church because they couldn't agree on the issue of uh, masks and uh, social distancing. And I'm thinking, man alive, you've got to be kidding me. When the Apostle Paul was willing to die for the church and you're willing to separate over your disagreement on this issue, Yes, have disagreements. Have your convictions. Of course you should have that. But that is not a primary issue. Anyway, that, would, that's, that, that lesson to me has been so clear from Fuller and Rowland's life. Anyway, question here. We do have a mic that's going around, so that'll be... Are you recording this? Yeah, okay. Since you mentioned about membership, um, like when you're just describing of the history of the friendship, um, that just made me think of, so as a member of the church, we have an element of obligation of how we are all to 
give our life and serve our brother and sister as one body of Christ. So I see that element of obligation, but you also briefly mentioned that friendship is not obligated and it's not a form of obligation to one another. It organically happened. So what would be the main difference and how, how do you encourage people to grow in friendship? Like when people are willing to serve at church and do life together with their brother, with brother, with your, with their brother and sisters. But how, how do you encourage them to grow in friendship and what it means to have it? Like what I can think of is some sort of mutual interest. Is that the, the thing that makes it distinctive from being, being part of the body of Christ? Or what, what would it be like being a friend? Yeah, that's a very good question. How, do, how, does, uh, being a fr- how, how does friendship differ from having brothers and sisters in the same body that you work and labor with uh, in a local church? Um, friendship is, first of all, again, becoming a member of a church, you make, you make a, 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 a vow, really. Um, you know, in our, our church, we have people come forward and they're formally received, some by baptism, some by letter of what we call letter of dismissal. Um, and uh, they, we have a membership class that they take in which they learn about their obligations as a member. If you're a member of a, a local church, you need to attend business meetings. Uh, you need to be faithful in giving, et, et cetera, et cetera, and serving uh, with your gifts. Friendship is much more, as I say, it's a much more fragile thing. Not, not every fellow believer in your local church is going to be your friend in the way we've been talking about. How many friends can you have like this? I hope you have at least one or two. Your spouse should be your friend in the way we've been talking. Um, I hope you haven't seen, but I have seen among Christians, sometimes spouses who aren't really friends. Um, Their marriages start well, but as time goes on, they drift apart. And they're no longer the sort of friends that we've been talking about. Um, friendship is, as I say, it's fragile. Um, it's, 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 there's an intangible element to it. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I have a friend named Tim Cooper, and he is a friend. He lives in New Zealand. He teaches history in New Zealand. I met him for the first time. We'd had a bit of email, but I met him for the first time at a conference, and we... Uh, it was a three-day conference, so we had a number of times to chat. It was like I'd known him all my life. There was something clicked. Uh, it was hard. It was v- I don't know how to explain it. Th- there's an element there. I, I don't know how to put that into words. And I'm sure all of you have done this. You've met people, and you, there's, there's a click there. Y- you've got mutual interests, yeah, but there's more than that. There's... You understand each other almost like even if you haven't known each other well, and um, and uh, and then the other the the other side of that is, is this: sometimes we meet people, they're fellow believers in Christ, and your temperaments clash, and you're required to love that brother as much as you love a friend, but you're never going to have a depth of a relationship though that you would have with a friend and. And you have, to, you have to recognize that's a reality. But you have to love that person nonetheless in Christ. And um, one of the things I've discovered as I've studied church history is that sometimes the theological debates between people have really got nothing to do with theology. They've got everything to do with personality. And the people didn't like each other, really. So there's two great Puritan leaders, John Owen and John Baxter, Richard Baxter, great Puritans, John Owen was a Congregationalist. Richard Baxter was a Presbyterian. So they differed in their understanding of church government. Um, They had a number of theological quarrels. But the reality is they didn't like each other. They couldn't stand each other when they first met, and they never got over that. But you can't say that as a Christian, (laughs) right? I just don't like the guy. So they framed it as theology. I've got a theological disagreement with them, which they did. But they didn't like each other. And um, it comes through at times, the way they, the language they use of each other. 
And sometimes, again, I'm, I'm sure all of you have met people in the body of Christ, their fellow believers, and you, does, you didn't click. And you have to try extra hard to overcome that. But the reality is you probably will, that person probably will never be a close friend, probably. Um, although sometimes you're surprised. I remember I have a very, I have a very close friend. We've been, he was one of my students. And when I first met him, um, I didn't really like him as a person. I, he came across as a brash New Yorker. He'd lived in New York. And he had all of that quality. Though if anybody, I, I won't ask if anybody here is from New York City. But he, he, he talked that way and he kind of acted that way. I grew up in England, so there was a bit of a cultural clash. But he became, he's become a close friend. And I, but I remember my first opinion, first, first kind of take on him. I thought, man, alive, where did that guy come from? And he wants to be a pastor in Canada. I thought, he's not going to make it. <laughs> because it's just his whole style was so American. And um, we, we have become very close friends. I, I will never forget um, there was uh, a, a, an incident took place where I, I was really down in the dumps about something. And he, 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 I, he called me and he said, I'll be right down. And he drove 30, 40 minutes just to come and sit with me in a Tim Hortons. And then when my, my wife is ill, has chronic fatigue, and uh, when he first found that out, he said, I'll be down with some food. And um, he went out of his way to go to a, again, he knew my wife is Scottish. He went to a Scottish bakery, bought all kinds of Scottish stuff, and dropped it off at my house and didn't even stay. And uh, I just, I, I have this sense that our friendship is such, I would do anything I could for him. And you don't have many people like that, but you have to have some. And I, I really hope you have friends like that in your life. But any other questions? Um, how do you think like your vision for friendship that you've outlined from the Bible and from uh, past Christian brothers and sisters fit into um, how many of us, including myself, uh, feel about friendship, especially living in a transient city where a lot of people move to Calgary for the real estate. And uh, yeah, it can get really discouraging because you don't know if there is any length of investment. Yeah, that's, yeah, we live in a very busy transitional world and given, as you say, real estate here in Ontario, the GTA, um, you, you know, I, I know of people now moving out to New Brunswick. Um, I couldn't imagine moving to New Brunswick. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Nova Scotia, PEI, but not New Brunswick, but anyway. <laughs> Calgary, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, the, the Rockies and Banff and Jasper. Um, uh, th that's, our, that's our challenge. And I think, I, think what you, I think what you have to realize is when you have a friendship and you realize, yeah, there is a there, there are all of the ingredients for a good, rich friendship there. I think you need, and, some, and one of you moves, you then need to invest the time to keep in touch with that person. And uh, email. And Zoom. And whenever you're out that way, you need to make time to see them. Um, I, I don't think, I mean, again, the Roman world is probably the most mobile world in Western Europe down to the n late 19th century. So there's a lot of mobility in this world, yet you have these friendships. And uh, Paul, you can see 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, he maintains these friendships through letters, not necessarily personal presence. And so I think you can maintain letters through uh, friendships in our world through emails. It's going to take you time. You're going to have to sit down and write email. I would actually challenge you to sit down and write a handwritten letter. I do do that. 
I write handwritten letters to friends sometimes, and also cards. I did this with my wife. Every, I would be away, it's no longer the case, at Southern uh, for sometimes three weeks at a stretch. So I'd write out cards. I'd write about seven or eight cards and number the envelopes so when she's o to open them. And uh, that takes time. Um, phone calls. Uh, again, it takes time. It takes, it takes effort. But if this is a friendship worth continuing, you need to invest that time. Um, and uh, Paul and Timothy obviously walked together, but they were obviously apart for periods of time. He, he would have used the letter as a vehicle of communication. And we have, we have incredible Zooming. I mean, I, it's not perfect, but at least you can see the person face to face and continue that relationship. Um, I hate to think of the amount of time. I have, I don't know how many close friends I have, probably easily half a dozen uh, individuals that, I, that I've built my life into. And um, they're in my prayers regularly. Um, and there's, 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 there's time there. And sometimes I'm I'm, a, I'm an academic, so there's a there's pressure to produce books and articles, and I look at other scholars and I think, man, alive, why is he, he's writing another book, and and I'm thinking, well, you know, I could have done another book if I just hadn't put all that time into talking to people. But people, that's why we're alive. Right? People are eternal, right? I. I'd love the idea that there's, there's a huge heavenly library. <laughs> I don't know, are there books in heaven? I don't know. But there are people. And uh, so I, my challenge there would be, yes, we live in a transient culture. Maybe, maybe one of the things, one of the reasons why we might decide not to move is that we would uproot and destroy friendships and lose friendships. That might be a reason why not to move. I mean, I, I know of Christians now who will move places for a local church or who won't move local pla places for a local church. So that might be a consideration. If I'm going to lose all these very good friendships that are essential to my life, okay, I'm going to have to figure out another way how to make the money work to stay here. All that to say friendship is vital. And even if you do have somebody moving away at that distance. There are ways of communication. And uh, you could fly swoop out to Calgary for, for 200 bucks. So. Anyway, any other, the one, maybe one last question, and then we'll, uh, I'll pray to close. Um, I like to get some piece of advice in regards with the friendship, you know, you mentioned before that uh, some people, they just make a click or they share things uh, that, um, you know, it's um, a good, um, in, uh, there are good ingredients to be good friends. However, they, um, one of them disappoints. What kind of uh, biblical support you can uh, bring other than forgiveness and, you know, how to get that trust that, uh, uh, you know, it's not just um, an event. I mean, if it is still trustable, the, the person, you know, to go ahead to entrust uh, a soul that's very valuable from my point of view. When you open, you get vulnerable and you, you feel uh, that you need... Uh, to think if you should uh, keep going with that friendship. If you can give some examples from people who, after an incident, they could uh, go back and build on that friendship. Yep, Thank good. You. Yeah. yeah, so friends do disappoint. I mean, we do have a good biblical example in uh, John Mark, uh, the story of John Mark. Uh, John Mark wrote, wrote the gospel that we know as Mark. Uh, John Mark's mentioned in the book of Acts. Um, I would argue that the Last Supper was in John Mark's house and the day of Pentecost, where the 120 disciples are in John Mark's house. 
because in Acts 12, in John Mark's house, they're having a prayer meeting, and uh, Peter is freed from prison, and he comes to John Mark's house, and we read that the servant girl, Rhoda, meet, met John Mark at the gate, and not at the door. And in Roman and Greco-Roman and Jewish house layouts, 2% of houses had an outside gate, which indicated you had a gate and then a garden and then the house. Virtually every house, you enter the house right off the street, which means that John Mark's house is probably, he's probably wealthy. Uh, whoever had the house where the day of Pentecost takes place, there's a room, you know, there's a room there can seat 120 people. Now, I have no idea, and nobody needs to tell me if you've got a room in your house that can do that. But if you've got a room in your house that can seat 120, you've got money, significant money. And um, John Mark goes with Paul on his first missionary journey. They get to Cyprus, and um, there's a number of conversions. This is in Acts chapter 11 or so. And one of them that is impacted by the gospel is the Roman governor, Sergius Paulus, who appears to indicate to Paul that he should go up to Antioch because he has relatives there. We know this from external sources. So Paul then goes from Cyprus, an island, to the coast of Turkey, what is now Turkey, and he's going to take a road. It goes pretty well straight up hill for about 130 miles. It's a very steep, narrow, dangerous road to walk. It's also dangerous because of bandits. And it's at that point, John Mark says, I'm out of here. And he goes back to Jerusalem. Later in Acts, in Acts 15, Barnabas, who's John Mark's cousin, we know that from Colossians, says, uh, we're going on the second missionary journey. Let's take John Mark. And Paul says, no, we're not taking him. And it says there was an argument, and the Greek word for argument is a paroxysm. Barnabas and Paul had an out-and-out -out major fight over John Mark. And Paul says, we're not taking this guy. He left us. He disappointed us. There's no way. And if you read, if you, as I was reading there, at the end of 2 Timothy, bring John Mark. He is useful for me for ministry. There's about 15, no, it's about 20 years in between. Uh, the, well, about 15 to, 15 to 18 years. So over that course of time, Paul obviously rebuilt his relationship with John Mark, or vice versa, and John Mark becomes part of the Pauline, Pauline circle again, and in, the, in time, he will write the Gospel of Mark. And um, so that's, a I think, a good example. I think the danger for some people, um, I remember seeing this in a pastor who was deeply wounded in a church here in Ontario, and uh, he then had two subsequent pastoral pastorates. In the one, the first one after that happened in Ontario in a church. Um, he, I could tell he was very, very wary about ever opening himself up to any of his people. He kept his distance, and I, I think that became a policy. He had been wounded, and he didn't want that ever happen again. Um, and I think, I think that's sad, because I think we will have friends who disappoint us and maybe wound us deeply. But that should not mean that we shut ourselves off to the joys of friendship. Um, I think we need to try to rebuild those friendships, if they were genuine and deep, um, we should seek to rebuild them. Um, sometimes that doesn't work. And I, I went through this uh, years ago in the early 80s. I, uh, my, uh, my wife and I led a Bible study that was part of Stanley Avenue Baptist Church where we went with about 40 people. It was called the Tuesday Night Evening Bible Study. 
It was linked to our church, uh, not formally part of the church, but linked to our church. Half the members went to our church. And uh, the person I led it with and his wife, we had a disagreement. Uh, this one particular week, he came and said, uh, this week I'm going to teach that speaking in tongues is the gift, it's the doorway to all the spiritual gifts. Both of us at the time were charismatic. Uh, Stanley Avenue Baptist Church was on the edge of the fellowship. Its pastor, Bruce Woods, was playing or toying with the charismatic movement. And uh, I was charismatic in my theological leanings, and so was he, but I didn't agree with him. But for the sake of our friendship, he was my closest friend. For the sake of our friendship, I said, fine, uh, you can teach that this week. After the week was over, I thought, no, I don't like that, disagree with it. And I went to him and I said, I, I, I think last week you were acting like a cult leader. And I don't know, I've, I, to this day I have no idea what was going on in his mind or his heart. He said, that's it. I'm out of here. I want nothing to do with that Bible study again. You can have it. And he, walked, he and his wife walked away from the Bible study. They walked away from our friendship. They walked away from church. And... Um, uh, I went to him, I apologized, I tried to rebuild the relationship. The last time I saw him, which would be about 25 years ago, on a bus commuting, I was coming into Toronto, and we saw each other, and he just looked at me with just hatred. I, I could just tell. He, there was no love there. I, I don't know what happened in that relationship. Uh, it hurt me really deeply. And I, I just thank God that that didn't poison me for friendships. Um, I, I think we've, we've got two choices in this world, in, the, in this regard. We can open ourselves up and build close friendships that may disappoint us and may even hurt us. Or we can close ourselves. And as I say, I saw a pastor who was deeply wounded by a friendship and he closed himself. And I think long term, uh, that maybe he was able to work with that. I couldn't personally, and I think you. I think that diminishes you as a human being. That you shut off the possibility of friendships because you might get hurt. And I think that's a that's a risk we have to run. Uh, and um, anyway. Thank you for this uh, morning, for coming and thinking together about this theme. Um, I think it's a very important theme for us as Christians in our world. Um, given the way our culture is moving, uh, we need each other, and we need, you, we need each other deeply in these friendships uh, to, to enable us to walk together uh, the, the road that God has called us in our day. Would you like to come and maybe close in prayer? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Haken, for being here uh, this morning. We're grateful for your ministry and for your um, walking us through the word um, on this valuable topic of friendship. There's a few other people I want to thank. Dale for playing piano this morning. Thank you. And Henry and Anne at the back there, they put together the coffee and tea and snacks and everything. So thank you guys for your, your help doing that this morning. We're grateful for you. Um, this has turned into, as Dr. Haken said, kind of an annual event. Um, and so keep an eye out. If you emailed us, we've got your email. We'll let you know when we're planning on doing this again. If it's in the Lord's plans, we'll um, let you know or check our website. And we'll plan on doing this again roughly around this time next year. We'll see on availability. The other thing that we did, uh, which was new this year, is we are, we're actually recording it. Um, so you can go back, and if you missed something or forgot something or went to the bathroom, you can uh, check out the whole thing online on YouTube. Just go to our YouTube page, uh, Richmond Hill Baptist Church, and you'll be able to find the lecture there and share it. Share that to anybody uh, who you think might be able to benefit from that. Uh, with that, we're going to close. And actually, Andrew Black, can I ask you uh, to just close our time in a word of prayer? One other thing is, did you mention lunch at all? No? No, I didn't. It is lunchtime. We have no lunch exactly planned, but within one or two kilometers of here, go to Young Street, there are restaurants north and south. So if you want to 
grab a friend, grab somebody that you don't know and strike up a friendship, you're more than welcome to, uh, to do that as well. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you are so kind and so gracious and so merciful to us. We thank you for Jesus most of all and for his sacrifice on the cross. We thank you for your word and for the instruction and the light that it is to our path. We thank you for the spirit which as your children resides within us and guides us and directs us and we thank you for that. But we thank you in your mercy that you have given us the church, that you've given us one another, you've given us dear brothers and sisters in the Lord to walk and to journey with. Father, we pray that we would not take these relationships lightly, but we would take them seriously and that we would use them to to bring honor and glory to your name, that we would sharpen one another, encourage one another, lift one another up when we are down. Father, we just uh, we thank you for this reminders this morning, for this teaching, and we pray that through your spirit that you would uh, implant it deeply within us and that you would transform us and shape us and make us more and more into the image of your dear son, Jesus, we pray. In Christ's name we pray all these things. Amen.